Just looking at the recent headlines is enough to make an American have a panic attack. The dollar is done, says one story. A post-dollar world is coming, says another. And perhaps the most fear-inducing headline was end of dollar dominance will also spell demise of US hegemony. But before you go cashing in your dollars for old brass buttons and pieces of used string, you should probably hear what we've got to say about that. We'll get to the analysis part soon, but first let's have a look at why some countries have indeed been giving the dollar the cold shoulder as of late. The term we use for this economic phenomenon is de-dollarization. The same thing happened to the British pound at the start of the last century. As many of you know, the UK's superpower status took a hit after the First World War, when its economy shrunk, fighting what it perceived as the globally ambitious upstart nation of Germany. As this happened, the British pound sterling as a reserve currency was gradually replaced with the US dollar. The USA came out of World War I in relatively good shape, and after the World War that followed, the US was even stronger, both politically and economically. In 1944, the Bretton Woods Agreement was signed, in which participating nations agreed their currencies would be pegged to the dollar. The dollar was then pegged to gold at a fixed rate. This meant that countries could trade together with a sense of confidence in the stability of each other's currency. It meant that they wouldn't get into currency wars, wherein a country might purposefully devalue its own currency for an advantage in trade. In short, the agreement was made to make the global economy stable. The International Monetary Fund was created for more stability, to give countries financial assistance if they needed it. After the chaos of the World War, such stability was a good thing. But of course, the fact the reserve currency was the dollar was also a very good thing for the USA. The dollar became the king of the economic jungle as the USA roared through the 20th century, often doing whatever the hell it wanted with significant economic and geopolitical advantages compared to other nations. The dollar was in demand, everyone needed the dollar, and the US controlled it. Because of that, the US was able to exert influence on other countries. Having the reserve currency also gave the US trade advantages. There's also something called seigniorage, which in short means the US made money from the production of money, since the cost of making it was less than what it was worth. It costs less than 10 bucks to make 10 bucks, and everyone wants or needs the bucks. Cha-ching. This is a very basic explanation, but all you really need to know is when the dollar became the world's reserve currency, that suited the US just fine. The US doesn't want this to change, but other nations have recently been saying that they have been exchanging their dollars for gold at an astonishing rate and also refusing to do certain trades in the dollar. The question is, why? Let's also give you some examples. In 2023, Saudi Arabia's finance minister Mohammed Al Jadan shocked the world when he said his country was open to doing oil deals in other currencies besides the dollar. This oil-rich nation had been trading its oil in dollars for 48 years. This really was a big story, and there are a few things to consider. China is one of them. Due to China buying about one quarter of all Saudi Arabia's oil exports, China is Saudi's largest trading partner. The countries have been close for a long time. But it seems they're becoming even closer these days, just as Saudi Arabia's relationship with the US has been somewhat strained at times. Importantly, Saudi Arabia is also a big part of China's Belt and Road Initiative, a multi-billion dollar, maybe a trillion dollar global development project that gives China tremendous influence around the world. This will help Saudi Arabia heavily reliant on its oil exports to diversify its economy. That will be needed when the world is less reliant on oil. These countries need each other. The two countries just made a deal in which state-owned Saudi Aramco will acquire a 10% share in the Chinese oil refiner Rongshen Petrochemical for $3.6 billion. At that same time, the former will provide 480,000 barrels a day of crude oil to Rongsheng's refinery for two decades. The small print on the deal doesn't really matter for this video, but what does matter is China and Saudi Arabia are getting closer, and it also matters that they're talking about doing deals in yuan, not dollars. What was even more surprising in 2023 was China mediating between Iran and Saudi Arabia, two countries that certainly have not seen eye to eye for a long time. China is brokering deals in the Middle East, while the US's relationship with many countries in the region has been quite touch and go. Some people have even talked about a post-American gulf. These nations may want to diversify their economies as the US primes itself for conflicts with China and Russia. They aren't playing ball with the US, and the US controls the world's reserve currency, so it makes sense to forego using that currency. As we said, because the US holds the world's reserve currency, it can exploit its position. The word generally used is weaponize the dollar, which seems to be motivating countries to trade in other currencies. The US can implement sanctions on countries, as we've seen with Russia. It can devalue its own currency to win trade wars, but this might harm the rest of the world. 
Again, it might make sense to dump the dollar for some nations. This is exactly what China has been saying, that the US has been weaponizing their dollar. It's less a weapon, of course, if countries use it less. The more deals are done in other currencies such as the Chinese Yuan, the less the greenback is like paper kryptonite. It loses its power. To some countries, the US is acting a little roguish, abusing its position as the country with the global reserve currency. For instance, it was able to freeze $300 billion of the Russian central bank's foreign exchange reserves when Russia invaded Ukraine. While the US has the full support of many nations, it doesn't in other nations, even if they think Putin's invasion was wrong and what's happening in Ukraine is a terrible thing. Many countries believe this is a proxy war, and the US, a bully to some nations, just flexed its muscles and ignored a rules-based international financial system. This made them worried. They might now be thinking, so every time the US feels like it, it can just freeze reserves? Some critics have talked about how this has undermined the US's international credibility. What if they refuse to do as the US asks? What'll happen to them? Countries are suffering because of what's going on in Ukraine, but some of them, especially in the Global South and the Middle East, are skeptical about the war and don't think they should be suffering for it. India's foreign minister was quite vocal about this when he recently said Europe thinks Europe's problems are the world's problems, but that world's problems are not Europe's problems. Some of these more neutral countries are not so critical of Russia, or even if they are, they take a broader view of matters and, in view of American foreign policy over the years, might not see things as black and white on the good and evil front. So when at the 14th BRICS summit in 2022, Vladimir Putin talked about creating a new international currency standard, some of them listened. They might be looking at the US's many sanctions over the decades and its somewhat coercive diplomacy and wondering if US dollar hegemony is in their best interests. The European Council on Foreign Relations said the world is divided on Ukraine. Importantly, it also wrote, people in these non-Western countries and in Russia also consider the emergence of a multipolar world order to be more probable than a bipolar arrangement. They're talking about a post-Western international order, which may mean an end to dollar hegemony. What we might now be seeing with countries foregoing the dollar is the start of this. Argentina was another country that lately announced it would start paying for Chinese imports in yuan, not dollars. The country's economy minister explained, Following the worst drought in history, Argentina must keep its foreign reserves robust. In April 2023, Argentina said it was planning on paying for around $1 billion worth of imports in yuan and $790 million of monthly imports after that also in yuan. This no doubt delighted China. Not so much the USA. While this might not have anything to do with the war, it shows how the country is strengthening its bond with China, and at the same time saying it wants less reliance on the dollar. Then you have Brazil, which the US has criticized for remaining neutral where the Ukraine war is concerned. Brazil's president, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, is not on any especially bad terms with the US, but his position on Ukraine has not exactly been in line with the US and the EU thinking. In 2023, he explained what some politicians and people in the Global South have been thinking when he said NATO should not have been installing military bases that close to Russia, given the promises of the past. He criticized Western politicians for encouraging war and not doing enough to negotiate with Russia in the run-up to Ukraine's invasion. He also blamed Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, saying he was as responsible as Putin for the war. The Ukraine foreign minister shot back, We have to clearly note Ukraine does not trade its territories. Silva's comment obviously made some people's blood boil, but outside of the mainstream Western media, many analysts have said similar things. The British historian Jeffrey Roberts, whose specialty is Soviet diplomatic and military history, wrote in a recent paper, could war have been prevented by a Russian-Western deal that halted NATO expansion and neutralized Ukraine in return for solid guarantees of Ukrainian independence and sovereignty? quite possibly. Many others say diplomacy was blocked by the US and UK, often citing the former US ambassador to Russia and presently the CIA director William Burns, who in a cable to Washington in 2008 warned that unpredictable and uncontrolled consequences and war could happen with the enlargement of NATO. They also might refer to Alexei Arstovich, a former military intelligence officer and former advisor to President Zelensky, who in 2019 warned, our price for joining NATO is a big war with Russia. Some say the US knew there would be war and went ahead anyway to weaken Russia, so some nations might be saying they will not suffer just for the US to gain more global influence. In terms of this video, it doesn't matter who's right or wrong, we're just trying to explain how some countries are thinking and the reason they might be upset with the US. They believe this war could have been prevented, and so they won't hurt for it. They're not willing to be an enemy of Russia. 
It's why Brazil, part of BRICS along with Russia, India, China, and South Africa, is just one of many nations that refuses to side with the US and NATO and will not agree to sanctions. Unsurprisingly, China has also talked about US hegemony and a new multipolar world. China just inked trade deals in Moscow. In a joint statement, they said Russia needs a prosperous and stable China, and China needs a strong and successful Russia. They added that they intended to increase the diversity and supply of agricultural products and food exports to each other. Russia's economy, despite the sanctions, has remained strong and will very likely stay strong for some years to come. One of the reasons is China, and the fact that many deals will now be done in yuan, not dollars. Brazil will too. In 2000, China wasn't even in the top five trading partners with Brazil, and now it's number one. It's the only country in the region to have hit over $100 billion in trading with China, and more deals have been made. We might now be at $150 billion. Many of these emerging economies seem to be thinking in a similar way. We hope you're starting to see a pattern here. At around the same time as Brazil and China made those deals, South Korea and Indonesia also agreed to use their respective currencies for trade. About a year later, India and Russia signed the rupee-ruble trade agreement. The US had pressured India to reduce its Russian imports under sanctions to Ukraine, and the EU prohibited trade in euro-denominated banknotes to Russia, so India was between a rock and a hard place. It chose the route out, straight down the middle. The country has been criticized, but as you know, India said Ukraine is Europe's problem. It said it's just taking care of business, and its moral duty is toward its own citizens. Ukraine said India is acting immorally and adding to Ukraine's suffering. But guess who is India's biggest arms supplier by far? Russia. It supplies 70% of India's arms. There's not a chance in hell India will turn away from trade with Russia. India has already inked a new bilateral payment scheme, meaning not in dollars, with the United Arab Emirates. Sticking with Asia, Bangladesh, Kazakhstan, and Laos are now in talks with China about new payment mechanisms. Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, and Thailand have all agreed to trade outside of the dollar. The Indonesian finance minister said in 2023 that the sanctions on Russia are a valuable lesson, saying countries will now just do transactions directly, bilaterally, using their local currencies, which he said was probably good for the world in the long run. Maybe not for the US, though. These countries don't want to choose sides. Their economies and their safety of their people, they say, might not allow them to choose sides. Like India, they might say it's easy to tell us what we have to do, but try being us. It should be said that the US's dollar brute strength of late, thanks to the US Federal Reserve raising interest rates, has also wreaked havoc in their nations, with the very poor being profoundly affected as food prices increase dramatically. In Singapore, a journalist summed this all up, saying, the US dollar has become a wrecking ball. Also, when European nations found they couldn't pay for Russian energy, Russia just demanded that they do the deal in rubles. Russia supplies gas to 23 European nations. While Europe is against Russia's invasion of Ukraine, some countries obviously feel they can't live without Russian gas. Reports state that four countries in Europe have already started to pay in rubles, and 10 European companies have opened accounts at Gazprom Bank so they can start paying Putin's chosen currency. Can the US do anything about such an activity? Some think not. They think the US doesn't have the ability to control other nations anymore, or at least not as it had in the past. Open Democracy wrote in 2023, the power of Western powers is undeniable, but it is also undeniable that the world is increasingly moving toward multipolarity. The article said that the global south will not be bullied. Many others argue that the days of do what we tell you or else are coming to an end, and de-dollarization is proof of that. De-dollarization is certainly catching on, which has led some pundits to call this a revolt against the US and its dollar. They say weaponization of the greenback doesn't work anymore. Bloomberg reported that at least a dozen countries in Asia are experimenting with a dollar alternative. It said this was unthinkable not even that long ago. The criticism isn't just coming from outside the US. An investment strategist in the US told The Straits Times the Biden administration made an error in weaponizing the US dollar in the global payment system. That will force non-US investors and nations to diversify their holdings outside the traditional safe haven of the US. Another thing that's happened is countries buying gold with their dollars. They may not feel right now the dollar is their safest bet. Gold is probably safer, given they don't know what the US is going to do next, and inflation could be on the way. China and Turkey were the biggest buyers, with India, Qatar, and Uzbekistan also ranking highly on the list. It was the biggest gold buyout in history by central banks. In 2022, they bought 1,078 metric tons compared to 450 tons in 2021. 
Again, this is countries thinking the dollar is at risk. A Japanese analyst explained, gold buying by central banks is a sign that the dollar's dominance is eroding. This gold purchasing activity is expected to remain rampant as countries opt for a safer economic path. So diversity is the word on the street in economics these days, just as much as it's one of the most used words regarding cultural issues. The world's economies are diversifying. In evolutionary terms, they're adapting to a new environment. It's survival of the fittest. But what will these new adaptations mean for the US? Some might say that the answer to this is the same as the answer to what happens to the alpha male chimpanzee when he leads with too much violence and is often unfair to the troop. Rebellion is the answer, always violent rebellion. But is this way over the top? Is the story of rebellion and the end of the dollar being exaggerated? Don't have a panic attack yet is what we say. We call this the good news and the bad news segment of the show. Let's start with the good news for the people that don't want to see the end of the dollar as the world's reserve currency. Ok, so first of all, changing a reserve currency would take a long, long time. You can't just supplant the reserve currency for the simple fact that about 60% of the global foreign currency reserves are in the dollar. It took many decades for the British pound to be replaced. It would be the same with the US dollar. It's true that in 2000 the dollar was 71% of global foreign currency reserves, but 60% is still a lot more than the yuan in circulation at 2%, the euro just 21%, the yen at 6%, and the British pound at 5%. As one analyst said, changing the reserve currency would be like telling the world that the English language should be replaced as a global language. The dollar is not done. If we look at global trade throughout the entire Americas, close to 96% of trading is in the greenback. That's not going to change anytime soon. Sure, in Europe, the euro is the currency of choice, but even then, 23% of trades are executed on the dollar. As for Asia-Pacific region, 74% of trading is done using the dollar. The rest of the world, 79% of trades use the dollar. You also need to know this. In 2022, the USA bought around $3.3 trillion worth of goods from other countries, but other countries only bought $2.1 trillion from the US. That leaves what we call a trade deficit. $1.2 trillion, not pocket change. So the foreign countries are sitting with a stack of dollars. They could spend it elsewhere, maybe in China, but then they'd have to convert their USD to do that. You can also only buy stuff in the US in USD. Instead, they buy what's called the most liquid security on the planet, which is US Treasuries. Some also hold on to the cash. It's thought the world has about $7.4 trillion in these treasuries and about $1 trillion in cash, about 46% of all the dollars out there. But the US offering these treasuries is a liability, and the countries must trust in the US and its dollar, which they obviously do. No other countries, according to the experts, are willing to take on this role, and even if they thought about it, they probably wouldn't be capable. Money makes the world go round, and the dollar is the oil for the engine. Without it, the economies of the world would grind to a halt and almost get conked out. Stories about the end of the dollar have been around for decades, which tells you something about their predictive potential. The media loves a good doom story, whether it's overpopulation, all the oil running out, or the end of the dollar. It gets eyes on their product, but it doesn't mean the stories are anything close to being true. Another thing is China is always mentioned in these stories. Still, economists often point out that China's economic model, it's well known for super growth over the last two decades or so, depends on the US dollar being the world's reserve currency. China doesn't want this to change. It can't change if China's well-being is to stay intact. And you have to ask the question, if China was thinking about knocking the dollar off the top spot, how many countries would put their trust in a new reserve currency? Sure, the US has problems, but it's not autocratic, and it's certainly more transparent than China, which is what governments want when they're entrusting their money with a country. China also has very strict capital controls, while the US doesn't have many. This makes the dollar the better option for a reserve currency. As one economic pundit explained, for all the troubles of the West, the US and the EU are coherent actors with deeply embedded institutional structures that are difficult to replicate. Now, for the bad news. Some people say the US has overplayed its hand too many times now. It's activated the ire of too many nations, playing school ground bully one too many times. Internally, much of the world sees the USA as a polarized social and political mess. This is another reason why there's a lot of talk about the end of US hegemony. The ship is sinking, they say, and rather than try to fix it, they're fighting over the gold and the jewels in the hold, which no one will have if the ship goes down. The critics say US politics, society, and culture is too much us versus them, rather than we. 
It doesn't scream stability, and other nations are taking note. There's been chatter about BRICS coming up with a common currency. More and more countries seem to be interested in joining the group, although it would be a pity to spoil that easy-to-remember acronym. The term BRICS Plus has been mulled over, but we think it sounds too much like a vitamin shake. On the BRICS waiting list are eight countries – Algeria, Argentina, Bahrain, Egypt, Indonesia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE. The countries thinking about joining are Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Mexico, Nicaragua, Nigeria, Pakistan, Senegal, Sudan, Syria, Thailand, Tunisia, Turkey, Uruguay, Venezuela, and Zimbabwe. By 2050, some of these nations are expected to be economically flying. You can expect more countries in the near future to want to join. The question is, will the dollar be done by then as the global reserve currency, or will that happen much quicker? It's easy to imagine the answer is yes to the former question. Many think the BRICS common currency is coming, especially as one analyst put it, these countries will outweigh not only the reigning hegemon, the US, but the entire G7 weight class put together. Still, that doesn't mean all you guys in the USA will be living among smoking embers of houses while running around trying to catch rats for your evening meal. One analyst argues that the dollar being replaced might not be such a bad thing for the US, given how much responsibility comes with it. He also said it seems unlikely that anytime soon this alliance will mount any profound challenge to the dollar, especially as its two biggest economies, India and China, can barely agree on anything. He reckons if they could, BRICS might just smash through the status quo. This means that the dollar status as the world's reserve currency is not going to change anytime soon. But, and it is a big but, a new world order is taking shape. How will that look? We can't say. But it will likely mean the US losing much of its power to influence what happens in the world. The new kids have been on the block for a while now. Their voices are deepening and they're growing big muscles. The US will remain a cultural, political, and economic powerhouse, but its days of global hegemony might be coming to an end. That's only a theory right now, not a fact. But what do you think about that? Now you need to watch Russia and China versus NATO, or have a look at Brazil's World War III plan.